it's it's now my pleasure to um, introduce David Mitchell. David Mitchell, of course, is no uh, stranger in, to our industry, a partner of. Mitchell, Mitchell Brampton, with over 30 years industry experience and a family background in, um, in construction consulting, David has a deep understanding of construction and development. David is passionate about people, ha has a collective ability to create and shape opportunities and for positive in industry change. He develops and implements project and enterprise cost strategies, consults on disputes, shares knowledge through teaching and conducting quarterly cost research. He's regarded as one of the best internationally, so we're very lucky to have, to have um, David called Br uh, Brisbane home and for him to be available to present today. I'd now ask you to uh, join me in welcoming David to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, thanks, Neil, and thank you to all of you for being here this morning. Um, over, over a number of years, you guys have heard me talk about approvals and construction costs. Um, today I want to approach things a little bit differently. And the reason that I want to do that is because cost-wise things are pretty stable. Um, and th they're stable if you're within that area of southeast Queensland. It's a different story in, in, the, um, in the regional areas that are affected by gas and mineral projects. But, Something that has been known for a long time is that productivity in the construction industry has suffered. Um, but of more recent times, structural changes in our economy are exposing Australian construction businesses to world labour costs as well as cheaper manufacturing and, and prefabrication techniques. And it's this event that is now giving our industry a wake-up call that perhaps there's a better way of doing things. Um, one of the things that's been occurring at the same time is the development of modelling and 3D technology. And that's been going on in the design space for the best part of a decade. Um, so it now seems set to be one of the enablers to reset the game and, 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 and take construction to a new level. So today, I'm going to cover off on um, the climate. We'll look at what's happening. We'll do that similar to the way we did last year, look at uh, some projects in southeast Queensland and some in Gladstone. Um, then I, I, I want to tell you a story about a project where um, I watched like an interesting outcome in terms of risk and how that was dealt with. Um, and once we've covered off on those more mainstream things, then I want to teach you some stuff. So. Uh, I want to share with you uh, a, a short clip about what BIM is because for the contractors in the room, you're going to hear a lot about this in the, in the next decade. Um, and I think it's uh, important for us to ground our terminology and get on the same base. But then what I want to do is, is, is give you some examples of different ways that people have applied technology to projects and then look at the future. Um, look at uh, some of the things that are being researched around the world um, and, and the types of things that people have been working on. So first of all, the climate. Um, I can't get rid of all graphs, so I'm only going to have two. Um, but this one is one that we've looked at before. Um, it's looking at all the approvals throughout Queensland. Um, the blue line is what's happening with construction costs. The green line is residential construction um, throughout Queensland and the red line is non-residential construction. We're looking at from December 1985 up to March this year. Now there's two things that stand out. One is if stuff happens in residential, it also happens in costs. So when you're thinking about trends, it's residential that's going to give us the leader to what will happen to costs in the future. The biggest problem we had in the development industry was this period here. It was November 2003 and costs rose by 20%. Um, now that was something that wasn't seen coming and it caused us a lot of difficulties at that time in terms of reselling properties, renegotiating contracts, that style of thing. So it's the type of thing that we're looking for in the future because like constant rise, steady stuff, predictable, that's all cool. We can deal with that sort of risk but if something happens that we're not expecting, it's terrible. The other thing that's interesting is all this up and down crap at this end. Um, what that is, is government stimulus. Um, so there's two things happening. This is the social housing. The first release is in that area there. And the second release is all of that. On the non-residential construction, it's 
this is the one, two, three releases of all the school building programs. And that's how significant they were. They kept people in jobs in the construction industry. Um, it probably promoted a trend that hadn't quite finished yet as well. So it's interesting when you look at how it's unfolded. The real trend through here is probably like that. Um, and in uh, Resi, it's more like that, sort of through there. Um, so Resi is pretty... There's not too much happening there when you look at it on the whole. In terms of non-residential, there's this little thing happening, which is interesting, and I'll be watching, but you can almost name the projects that are creating it. One is um, Sunshine Coast University Hospital, which is $2 billion, and it came through in the approvals a couple of months ago. Um, so we start to pick these things up pretty quickly. One William Street is in there as well. So we'll find that there's these opportunities on projects, and they will actually have an effect on our stats at the moment. Now, this is what's happening in the cold. So we're going to look at costs in the cold, so around southeast Queensland, and we're going to look at costs in the hot areas, in particular Gladstone. Um, this is five, five projects in the low-rise apartment space, so around about, you know, there's sort of six storeys, that type of thing. Um, the average price uh, of those projects is $1,781 uh, $1 a square metre, and the range is fairly extensive. The low price is sort of $1,530. But when we looked at this last year, that was the stats we had in June. So the thing is, is the costs just aren't really changing. Um, we'll look at some other areas where they are changing, because housing is interesting. It is actually changing. Um, but the thing is, is it might feel like costs are going up and down. You might get uh, uh, feedback from the market. But when you look at the rolled up product, it isn't really. It's staying about the same. Looking regionally, so if we're interested in places like Gladstone, it's this black line. Now, the reason that Gladstone is cool for me to look at, it's not so cool to be building in, um, is because it, it, it's it's reflecting what happened in 2003. So we, this is its approvals. Um, Gladstone, in its biggest year prior to gas coming in, developed around about 700 houses a year. It's now doing about 1,400 houses a year. Um, it's been on the climb now for three years. And when we looked at their construction costs last year, it wasn't really moving, but now it is. And so I'll give you this sort of um, sense of the once we start seeing a rise in activity, the costs lag, so it's, they sort of creep and creep, and then they'll explode. And that's the period that you want to miss. So these are four projects around about a year apart in Gladstone. Last year, we looked at these three. Um, now, these three are cool because they were almost identical. They were the same height. They had similar number of units. One of them was actually an exact repl replica of the stage one before it. Um, but the costs in the first year just crept about 2%, and then the next year they crept about 4%, and I'm looking at the stats and I'm thinking, this can't, it, it, we should be paying more at that time. When that project was let at 1,800 a square metre, the client probably would have paid 2,200 or 2,300 a square metre, but the bill for that. Where we are now is this more recent project at two th almost $2,500 a square metre. So that's a problem if you based a uh, feasibility study on $1,800 a square metre. Now, it's a little bit unfair because this is not um, a comparable project. So the, the product, the residential product in this one is it's much, much smaller. It's short-term accommodation, so it's actually quite different. But what is consistent is all the structure and the, and, the, and the base building stuff, and that's actually increased by 17%. So this is this notion of when you get a, a rise in a trend in, in terms of uh, uh, volume and activity, the costs will, costs will move, but they're probably two to three years behind when you see it. Um, then, when they come off the back, they actually take a long time to drop off as well. So we see activity drop off, and it might be around about a year once, uh, build it, once the um, existing work gets built through before you start to see prices come down. What's holding costs at the moment is this expectation that, um, and, it, and it's from subcontractors and the head contractors, that if I don't win this job, the next job I win is going to be even cheaper. There's going to be less margin in the next one I win. And if I don't win, you know, there's going to be less work next year than there was this year. It's basically the, the psyche within South East Queensland. It's different in um, New South Wales. So we're starting to see some real change um, in the Sydney zone. So it'll be interesting to see if that starts to lead out to where we are. 
So that's sort of a sense of um, um, the trend, you know, what, what's actually happening. Now what I want to do is look at some of the prices that we're seeing on projects. Um, and I just want to do it at a summary level um, this time. So the, basically what I got down, down this side is different types of product. These are the sort of price ranges in terms of maximums to minimums. Um, over this side is the recommended range. Now, bear in mind, by, when I'm suggesting recommended, it's not that I'm saying I think that's reasonable or being judgy about those prices. It's more that if, um, if for instance, if you were going to base uh, a feasibility study on that number there of 1530 per square metre, where I think you would have a lot of difficulty doing that. You would have to really work hard in the design to reach that sort of number. Whereas hitting in this sort of range, you will reach. You're still going to have to work pretty hard in the design, but you'll get there. Um, one that's uh, uh, in terms of, so we looked at the low-rise apartments there earlier. Mid-rise apartments there, in the sort of, it's basically 10 to 20 is about where the products are to uh, topping out at the moment. Um, range is pretty predictable um, in this around just under $2,000 a square metre, which is slightly different to where we were last year. But houses is a really interesting one. Um, I think when we looked at this last year, it was about 980 or 970 per square metre up to about 1,030. What's happened in houses is they're all getting smaller. So this is um, 37 houses that were tended in the last six weeks. Those houses in terms of their area are smaller than what they were before and then you've got this different thing happening of, well if something's small then I need to make it higher quality. So we're seeing a change in terms of rate. The overall cost of a house is about the same but its, it's area, sort of, its geometry is changing. And we'll look at it a little bit, um, a little bit more down the track because houses are pretty, pretty interesting. Um, in the subdivision space, big range, um, but we know that's all driven by the physical conditions of the land. Um, the, the sort of mainstream stuff that we're seeing is in this sort of range, 62 to 70,000 a lot. Um, in terms of headworks, they're ranging from about 17 to 23,000 a lot, so there's a, a little bit more sense in that sort of space as well. In terms of the future, um, the next 12 months, I don't think we're going to see any change in terms of costs. I think we can, if you, if you pitch your project at the right sort of a uh, number at the outset, I don't think you need to be allowing for any sort of escalation at this stage. Um, if you're working in regional areas, it's, it's all about understanding what's happening in that market. Um, so Gladstone's tough at the moment. Mackay, if you noticed on the spaghetti graph before, the approvals there have been strong for around about two years, so I'd be lo like looking at, at Mackay and expecting it to, to go bang in terms of costs. Um, when you talk to people in Mackay, they feel like costs have been rising anyway, but I don't think they've seen anything yet. Um, um, it could be significant if it continues to build in that area. Um, places like uh, west of Rocky is hard. Um, Toowoomba is cool, like weather-wise too. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, because of its, its sort of closeness to Brisbane, you're able to, get, you're able to draw lots of builders to the area and get some reasonable prices. Once you get west of there, it gets hard again and it's sort of specific. Um, so yeah, I'd just be careful when you're, when you're looking further afield. In terms of an interesting outcome, um, now this is a project that I was involved in about three years ago. Um, and the reason why I want to share it with you is because it started to set me down a, a, a line of thought. So I started thinking about, well, this, this is something that we could do better. Um, it's a pretty cool project. Um, um, it has the Stokehouse restaurant in it. It's down at South Bank. It's designed by Andrew Guttridge. But this was the first image that he, he did of it. And uh, um, if he didn't provide me with this image, we would have no idea what we were building. Because looking at it on plan, it just looked like blobs. Um, but this is the project when it was finished. So the, the nexus between a model and what's built is really, really strong. This is something that is now, um, the reason why I'm sharing this with you in terms of a climate is this is a trend that is starting to get in, in, in uh, very, very strong in the design space. Um, so we get this strong understanding of what a project's going to look like. Application to the development industry is if you're able to show a purchaser that this is what you're going to get, and then you're able to deliver that precisely, you're not going to find that people are trying to get out of contracts because you haven't given them what, they, what you promised. Um, that's, the main, that's the main application for us. Now what they did on that 
project is, the designers that is, is they lay out a model together. So they got it, they, it's called a federated model. So you're looking at different designs laid on top of each other. And they coordinated it. What was the cool thing that happened on that job? Up until now, everything I'm talking about is on this everywhere. Um, this is the cool thing that happened is the engineer's model, which was a company called Opus, they, uh, the structural steel fabricator asked for a copy of that model and he built his own. And then he fabricated from that model. And this is it going up. So the, the structure came together exactly as planned. Now what I was most interested in is the risk. So we had one area where we had this structural steel thing happening and we had another area where it was more of the mainstream type of way of designing. And these were the results. So in terms of growth in cost, on the, on the whole project, costs grew by 27%. Now for a project like this, which is iconic, that's not unusual. Um, and as well as that, it had an awful lot of risk within the project. So it was built over the, um, one of the things I had to deal with was the 1988 diving pools uh, for Expo were underneath the ground there. So they had to be dealt with in a number of other things. But what is really interesting is how structural steel only changed by 2%. What happened in that instance is all of the design decisions to do with structure were all brought forward. Um, so there were changes when the subcontractor was involved that started to mean that the design had to change so it could be built. All of those were negotiated before they started. So the costs didn't come out, they, they didn't come out in terms of delay, disruption, rework, that sort of stuff, which is what we saw in here. Now, from a client's perspective, he was ecstatic because the job was under budget. Right? But the only reason it was under budget is because we had a reasonable contingency on it and we had a low bid contractor. So these things mixed together uh, sort of make it, make it a bit of a melting pot. So I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, why can't we do that for a whole project? Um, if we can make construction more certain, it must reflect in prices down the track. So what I want to do now is share with you something... Uh, and this is a short video. Um, the reason that I want to share it with you is so that you're going to hear about this thing called BIM down the, uh, If you're not already exposed to it, you're going to hear more about it. And I want you to have a reasonable what this topic is about. So you can understand whether you want to be a part of it or, or not. Um, because it's a, big, it's a big, big thing. When it comes to BIM, everything begins with a 3D digital building model. This model, however, is more than just simple geometry and some interesting textures added to it for visualization. A true BIM model consists of the virtual equivalents of the actual building sections used to create a building. These intelligent elements are the digital prototype of the physical building elements such as walls, columns, windows, doors, stairs, etc. that allow us to simulate the building and understand its behavior before the actual construction begins. Now let's see what a BIM model can be useful for. 3D visualization. Of course, the most basic use of a BIM model is for creating realistic visualizations of the planned building. Your BIM model helps your design decisions by comparing various design alternatives and for selling your design to your client, the local community, and other stakeholders as well. Building Simulation BIM models contain more than just architectural data. Information about the different engineering disciplines, sustainability information, and other characteristics can be easily simulated well in advance of actual construction. Data Management BIM contains information that is not visually represented at all. Scheduling information, for example, clarifies the necessary manpower, coordination, and anything that might affect the outcome of the project schedule. Cost is also a part of BIM that allows us to see what the budget or estimated cost of a project might be at any given point in time during the project. So, that, that video, it feels like it's a long time. It did for me, anyway. It's two minutes. In terms of in the marketplace, they've been banging on about this thing for around about 15 years. There are massive texts on it. Um, for the contractors in the room, you're starting to, you, are started, you are going to start to, 
uh, hear from government insisting on this stuff that, that's um, to be implemented. Well, all I wanted to do here was sort of ground our discussion about what it's about. What I take out of this is the pieces that I can apply. Now something that is fundamental is that the model must be parametric. Um, so you'll have people talking about different types of models and how they use them, but the fundamental thing is that they must be parametric. What parametric means is that the database that drives it is from a model, and if you, if you create a plan, it's a slice, and everything's the same. There are lots of products out there where the, the visualization is actually a separate piece. It's a separate view. So when you change a plan, the view doesn't change. So if as a developer, I want to keep my, the people that have purchased uh, uh, a unit up to date with the design changes, I can't do it if it's not parametric. So in the parametric space, it's, it's um, automatic. We'll talk a little bit more in terms of, of how these things can be applied. So all I want to do now is share with you three examples, and there's gazillions of these, but I've picked three from different spaces of how different people are applying, applying, this, um, uh, applying models to save money. So first of all, this is, this is the cost structure of a house, right? And the problem with houses is they've got 57 trades in them. Um, so you've got a house that's around about two hundred and twenty or $230,000 and it's got 57 trades in it. Now that's no different to a, a commercial building, but the cost centres are much bigger. Once you get past the top five, all of the other costs, I think there's something like about 21 trades that don't even account for a percent each. So the problem with houses is that you've got to work on the whole house you can't just work on a specific area or a piece or a room or that sort of thing. You have to actually work on the whole house. Now, this is the way one mob do it. Um, they use something that's called a trial budget calculator. Now, they, it's a company called uh, C2C, Concept to Completion. Um, now, what they're finding in their dealing with customers that want houses built all the time is that they have a preference for purpose design. So rather than pushing standard designs to people, they have a preference for being a part of that design. The problem with that is that the way they're behaving now is a little bit different to what the way they've behaved in the past. So the past would be, I've got a design, tell me how much it's going to cost. Whereas now it's flipped around, it's I've got a budget, tell me precisely what I'm going to get for that budget. And they're interested in the room sizes and the quality of the level of finish and that sort of stuff. But they want to know it in, in, in ex extreme detail. Now that's very, very hard to do unless you've been through a full design process. So the way these guys do it is um, it's linked to models. Um, and they've basically got a tank load of recipes that are doing all sorts of calculations. Um, so for example, a garage. They're making an assumption that it has one window, that it has one light switch, um, that it has four light fittings, that sort of thing. And they've got all of these quantities that are driving out of the different room sizes. So they feed in the, um, the family area, the room size. They do this when they're in front of their client. Um, and then they choose a quality level. Now, something we've done in the past is more look at the quality of a house at a whole. In this instance, they're picking the quality of a house of each individual room. So you're saying, I want my master ensuite to be high quality, but my laundry, well, it can be back of house sort of stuff. Um, so you start to get very selective about it. When they work that through and they find out that what they want doesn't match what their budget is, then you start going back the other way so you get a concise brief. Um, and it's driven by recipes and, and then models. This is another application, um, and it's about price transparency, negotiation. In the development industry, most of the product, projects that we do are actually negotiated price. We seldom go out to the market and tender to 21 builders. Um, we sit down and, and, and we want to talk with a specific builder and we want to work out that price. Something that I've seen happen over the years is you have the first discussion, um, then design changes, and the the, on the owner's space, they're always feeling like, I'm not sure if I got all the money back for that deletion. Um, and you're having discussions like, well, you deleted the living room area and it's not as expensive as a bathroom area. You know, if you deleted one of those, you would have saved a lot of money, but in this instance, you're not going to get anything. Um, so you have this discussion about it and there's no transparency to it. Ultimately, you cut a deal and you move on. But by using this stuff, um, what 
linking a model together with costings, it's instantaneous. Any change that happens is reflected in the cost. Um, what we're looking at here is Perth Children's Hospital, which we worked on in Brisbane, over in Perth. It comprises of 56 separate models. Um, what we're comparing is one model that was done two weeks before and it basically indicates what's been revised, what's new, what's deleted and it adjusts the costings to suit. So it's instantaneous. In terms of timing, those 56 models we can revision in two days. Now that was something that just wasn't physically possible in the way I worked um, traditionally. Um, it, it, we just couldn't do it. By the time we had finished an estimate, it was already out of date because the drawings had moved on. So this is something that's changed. And it's about tra transparency in negotiations. This is another example. So um, this is something on site. So looking at robotic set-out stations. These things here, um, like uh, the sort of, the best ones in industry are Trimble product. Um, and basically they're using lasers to set out, to set out spots. The way it's used on buildings is um, driven by modelling information. The old way that this would be done is a surveyor would, um, uh, e even with his, his laser set out, he would bring it to the, to the feet of the slab, like this project here, and he would shoot the dots um, onto the feet onto the of the slab where fixings had to go. A guy would climb up a ladder, spray it with paint, he'd go away, another guy would come along, put a fixing there, another guy would come along and put a booker rod there, and then you'd start to see a pipe, or a duct, or that sort of thing. What this guy's doing is he's not praying, um, He's on the deck before the concrete's poured and before the reinforcement is put in place. And he's a, he's a normal Cheney, but he's got a staff and it's talking to that laser and telling him when he's in the right spot. Then he gets a ferrule and he drives it into the deck. And that's it. The formwork's stripped and the ferrules are there and you go to fix the stuff on site. So it's, the thing is, is that each one of these things are reliant on models to make them work. Um, so when we stay in a 2D space, we're actually limiting our opportunities for things down the track. And these sort of ideas, there are gazillions of them, and they're coming up all the time. So what I want to do now is just share with you some of the stuff that's out there. Um, and, uh, and so this is in the world space, and I want to look at three different things. Um, um, one's robotics, and another one is um, to do with 3D printing. And we'll watch some videos on this. So 3D printing... Yeah, just hold on one sec. Um, so 3D printing is something that's been around forever. Um, the technology was in our bubble jet printers. So basically in those days, if we wanted bulb print, you just printed a lot in the same spot and the, and the ink got thicker and it was bold. Um, what these guys are doing now around the world, and there's about 50 different organisations that are working in this way, is they now print with 50, uh, 26 different materials. Um, so they're printing with concrete, they're printing with glass, there's even medicos that are printing with people's skin cells um, and they're creating organs. It's really cool stuff. Um, in the past, uh, it's been about making components, but now we've got people that are looking at, well, why can't I print a whole building? Um, and this is some of the things. This uh, animation uh, shows the concept. Uh, the material, which is cementitious materials, initially concrete, is deposited through a nozzle, and uh, the building is built layer by layer. An electrical installation can be done. So rather than using continuous rebars, we can have segments of rebar automatically inserted and assembled inside the building. Well, this is one of the machines that we've developed. Uh, as you see, uh, the nozzle is secreting a pretty dense concrete, this concrete is high performance and it is mixed with uh, fibers, composite fibers. It gives you a pretty good strength, kinds of configuration for these robots. Uh, this is like for a single uh, detached residential building. Uh, you can have a multi-nozzle machine that will be good for large building. So these nozzles work concurrently or you can have the machine climb the building. So that's a, kind of a sense of what that's about. The, ki the key thing to it is it doesn't work unless you've got 3D information to put in it, 
put in it in the front end. Um, where they're at is the machines are all reliable. They've now been using them for about a decade. So the machines are all set. It's the next decision is how do I take that to site? And if you think about a building in the future that doesn't have any formwork in it, I mean, that's an interesting sort of initiative and, and something that would, would um, start to change our cost profiles. Now, the other one is robotics. Um, again, this is driven by, this is a parametric model that's driving it. This dude, um, um, there's a mob called Robots in Architecture, and it's cool to sort of watch what they do and, and, and how they're working. But basically, this robot, which is one that used to build cars and stuff like that, it's in a box, you bring it to site, and it does stuff. Um, so you, uh, uh, it's driven by parametric information, and what this one's doing is it's laying bricks. Right now, every one of these bricks is in a total, is, is is individual, it's at a different angle to every other brick. So this robot, it's not that it can do stuff efficiently, it can do things with a level of accuracy that we've never done before. And, and when we're using new technology, it starts to introduce things in design that we never thought were possible. Different levels of quality. Um, um, it's like um, uh, Andrew Guttridge's project. When, when we're looking at the structural steel, and the cantilever on that is 18 metres. Now, Without using the technology that they used, that wouldn't have happened, that design element, and it's a pretty cool part of the building. Um, so this guy, he doesn't just lay the bricks, he also puts the mortar on it because every piece of, mor uh, every mortar strip needs to be laid in a particular way so it'll stick to the one below it because everyone's different. So it's just a different way of using things. Um, I want to show you these guys as well because these are the coolest. Um, agile swarming robots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, now what this technology is about is it's taking what um, uh, America has been using to blow up terrorists forever, drone technology, they're putting it in this little robot that's about this big um, and it gives it its, its agility and its ability to move fast and do things with precision. So you haven't got a, 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 um, like a, a plane that sort of oars all over the place, these things are very precise in the way they work. They're then providing it with some information about what they would like to do. Um, in this instance, it's a parametric model. Um, and they have onboard sensors. So these robots are looking at each other and they form a swarm. So they do things collectively together. Um, so just have a look at. So again, these robots come really close together. As you can see in this figure eight flight, they come within inches of each other. And despite the aerodynamic interactions with these propeller blades, they're able to maintain stable flight. Another application I want to show you, again, this is in our lab. This is work done by Quentin Lindsay, who's a graduate student. So his algorithm essentially tells these robots how to autonomously build cubic structures from truss-like elements. So his algorithm tells the robot what part to pick up, when, and where to place it. So in this video you see, and it's sped up 10, 14 times, you see three different structures being built by these robots. And again, everything is autonomous. And all Quentin has to do is to give them a blueprint of the design that he wants to build. So I want to show you a clip with algorithms developed by Frank Shen and Professor Nathan Michael that shows this robot entering a building for the very first time and creating this map on the fly. So the robot then figures out what the features are. It builds the map. It figures out where it is with respect to the features. and then estimates this position 100 times a second, allowing us to use the control algorithms that I described to you earlier. I can ask this robot to go in, create a map, and then come back and tell me what the building looks like. So here, the robot is not only solving the problem of how to go from point A to point B in this map, but it's figuring out what the best point B is at every time. So essentially, it knows where to go to look for places that have the least information, and that's how it populates this map. So it's a different example again. Um, something that is used fairly, fairly uh, commonly in construction now is um, 3D laser scanning. So go and scan existing buildings and, and use those for town planning applications for basis of design, that sort of stuff. One of the limitations that has been in the past is you can't get into concealed areas. So this type of thing starts to um, give the potential to do things in a different way again. Um, these things were designed for originally was to go into buildings that have been, um, uh, you know, burnt or um, in an earthquake, that type of thing, check out what the building's all about, and they're designed so that they'll swarm and pick up a person and take them out of that building. So that was their original thinking, but then 
it just gets used in different ways and this is what I think is cool about this stuff is um, I mean, you can get involved in technology for technology's sake, but if you're looking at what's out there, there are particular things that have applications. What's cool at the moment is there's old technology, it's not experimental, and it's being used in different ways, and ways that it wasn't designed for. So what does all this mean for costs? Um, this is a complicated chart, um, but it's, it's something um, that I put together um, in the last six months. Um, so, something that you understand about costs is whether you get a saving for it or not depends on how you contract and when you form that contract. Um, so the example that we looked at were on South Bank at the beginning, um, it's down here, right? So it's about having accurate construction documents. The saving to the owner is only that he's not going to pay an extra cost for a claim that might come down the track. So it's really reduction of risk. For him. Who gets that saving is actually the subcontractor that's doing the work. So if his work becomes more efficient, he's the person that gets that gain. Um, as these processes start to get more used in industry, in a decade's time, and subcontractors feel like their sites are run efficiently, their prices will come down. But it's going to be some time before people start to reduce their price. If I went along to a um, concrete at the moment and I said, man, we're going to use this technology and it's going to cut your costs like you wouldn't believe, he looks at me like, uh-huh. Um, why would he change his price? Um, but the thing is, is in this, in this phase where you're implementing, he will get that. The real thing that we need to focus on is in this area, functional efficiency. Now, if you've already contracted with a builder and it's DNC and, that, and he makes that building more efficient, he's actually going to get that saving. Whereas if you make your building the right sort of shape and you're, you're, you're getting those efficiencies within it, you're going to see that saving. But it's before it's priced. Um, so all I want to do here is give a sense um, and, and remind people that when you're looking for savings, it depends on, on uh, uh, the phase that that project is at and it also depends on how you contract. So I hope I've given you some stuff to think about. I don't know whether it lived up to the title, because um, that was pretty big. Um, but something that, that is, is, is clear for me is that tech, really what we're about is creating certainty. Technology is one of those things that can assist that to happen. The first step is to first is have a parametric model. The next step is to then have people that model the way something is built. Um, and if you're not in that sort of space, you're limiting your opportunities down the track. These just are, in the 2D world where you're working with drawings, it just isn't possible. There's no way that you can do any of these things when you're working with paper. In terms of costs, southeast Queensland, I mean, costs are going to be pretty predictable and I think they'll be stable. Um, really, it's about understanding the trend. So, so I hope I've given you a sense of where to look and, and, and how to keep an eye on things. Um, and no doubt, the market is tough, but what's really cool about these times and what, it, what excites me is that this is, when this is when real innovation happens. I mean, people are forced to look and do things in different ways. Um, and out of the other end of it becomes some magnificent organisations, some really great um, businesses to be a part of. So thank you very much. Um, and if you're interested in any of this sort of stuff, you can find it at our website. There's um, all sorts of information on it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, listen, we've got maybe uh, time for one question, if we've got a question. Could you just, um, there's a microphone there. Advise who you are and... Uh, um, Hello, David, David Pradella. Thanks very much for that. Very enlightening. Um, it's actually a question in two parts. I'm trying to sneak something in. Uh, first part, just to clarify, when you talk about cost per square metre, is it per built metre or per GFA metre? I'm just not sure what's... Uh, fully enclosed covered area. Fully enclosed covered, OK. Yeah, so basement car park as yep. well as internal spaces. Fantastic. And, and then the other question was um, the BIM process. Is there a rule of thumb to give me an idea of what that adds to the cost up front in the consultancy process when you go through your QS uh, process uh, of estimating construction costs yeah. up until the point you tender? Yeah. Um, obviously, I could see where the savings come in, but I have no idea of what this extra benefit costs. So design fees, that yeah, type of thing? Yeah, the design fees. Yeah. Shouldn't cost you anything. Should be the same sort of cost as what you were paying before. Um, um, 
to give you an example, I was uh, in New Zealand last week and there was an engineer that was presenting his stuff. Um, his man hours per sheet, um, where he's calculating it, because basically you're working in 3D but then drawings for contracts are still issued. Um, so his man hours per sheet were down 35% by using a product called Revit. Um, and, and there was an architect that told a similar story. Where it's actually at is you're not going to see a saving from these guys. I mean, they've actually been learning this, this way of working for a long time. Um, but anyone that says it's going to cost you more uh, doesn't know what they're doing, basically. Thanks very much. One last question. Yeah. Sorry, David. Uh, just, just by clarification, with the gentleman's asked the question, our experience has been that it front end loads the design process somewhat, so that the cost of the BIM is moved a bit more forward. In yeah, the true. Design it'll, phase. it'll, it'll, it'll change the way. It'll change the uh, so. Overall package will be the same, but you end up with doing more work earlier. Yeah, um, so it's something, yeah, in terms of getting a project off the ground where you may not have DA yet, you want to time that in the right way. Um. All right. Thanks, David. Thanks very much. I've got a gift here for you. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, that brings the uh, end of today's formalities. Again, I'd like to thank Landscape uh, Solutions, our sponsor, for, uh, for helping us for s uh, their support today. Um, and I'd also uh, thank you again for coming to this um, morning breakfast, and um, hopefully I'll see you again at the next UDI event. Thank you. I'm going to be talking to you about um, two cost strategies, and they're two cost strategies in what is two very different markets. I also want to talk to you about something um, that some commentators are calling the new frugality. The best thing about this technology is it's real now. It's been talked about, and, and our, uh, you know, Mitchell Brantman's been working with it for a decade, um, but it's now real and it's reliable.